Let's get this thing started. Hindsight is always 2020, right? You've heard that probably more than once in your life. Uh, some of us have made some pretty dumb choices in our lives, whether it's uh, fashion, fashion choices, the way that we have dressed at some point, uh, hairstyle choices. I'm talking to myself here. Uh, if you've seen old pictures of me, uh, it's pretty rough, um, or maybe even but maybe some more serious things than that, too. There's just been some times in your life where you're like, hey, I did this, and I thought this was going to happen, but actually that happened. And it threw, us, it threw you for a loop. And it's like, man, if I could do that differently, I absolutely would. Um, for me, personally, there are pictures of me that exist out there that you guys are never going to get to see because I wiped them off the Internet. But... Uh, <laughs> a lot of you have seen some pictures, and if you haven't and you just want to, ask the kids in the youth group. Their favorite thing to do is take screenshots of old pictures of me and show them to people. They think it's hilarious, so uh, <laughs> they, they love to do that. Uh, but that's, just, that's a little bit of a lighthearted example from me. Um, there's also some very real things about my life, though, that I would change if I had the opportunity uh, to go back and do it, um, I would change the way that I went about some relationships that I had. Uh, I would change the way that I went about some things that I did, the types of people that I would surround myself and spend time with, uh, the people that influenced my life. I would take my relationship with God way more seriously than I did at a young age. Uh, and I would get myself into a place earlier on in life where I didn't feel so alone, okay? Uh, where I didn't end up in a place in my life where I was very uh, socially, I was far from alone, uh, but mentally and spiritually, I was very, very isolated, right? How many of you guys can relate to that today? Maybe you're, you're in this room, you're not alone physically, but mentally and spiritually, you're more alone than you've ever felt in your life. Uh, something that I found very interesting as I was preparing for this message is there was some research done after the COVID-19 pandemic. Some professors from the University of Virginia did a study on how that season of our lives affected uh, people uh, with, who had addictions in their lives. Uh, and their conclusion was this, is that isolation is to addiction what community is to recovery, okay? Uh, and I believe there, there's truth to that statement in more than just addiction recovery, right? Like community, God never designed us to be alone. You were not created to do things on your own. Uh, we are at our core designed by the creator of the universe to be in community with one another, to be together, to do things together, and not just in the presence of other people, but like in the thick of it with other people. There should be people who know what's going on in your life. There are people who know what's going on in my life that I can call and say, hey, I need, and they go, hey, I'm right here, and they could do the same thing for me. That is the kind of community that we're hardwired to be a part of. That's what God created us to do. We are meant to spend time together. We're meant to have meals together. We're meant to get to know each other for who we really are. And if that doesn't sound like small groups, <laughs> I don't know what does. So uh, when the fall semester launches, there's my plug, get in a small group. Because that's what Christy's clapping. She knows what small groups are about. Um, you should be a part of one. It's going to be great, I promise. Uh, it'll change your life. Um, but I want to say this really quick, and I want you to hear it. I want you to receive it well from me. For those of you who are struggling with addictions, uh, the people who are part of that study, this is what they said, rebuilding social connections was just as important as mitigating their withdrawal symptoms. Think about that for a second. The people that they surrounded themselves with, the people they chose to get in community with, were equally as important to them growing into everything that they were supposed to be 
as mitigating the symptoms of their withdrawal from the thing they were addicted to in the first place. We were created to be a part of something with others. God wants you to know today that putting your focus on Him and your faith community is going to be the thing that gets you out of wherever you are right now. That thing that you feel like you need to tuck away, hide away. No one at the church needs to know that I struggle with this. They're going to look at me funny. They're not going to want me to come around. They're going to tell me to leave. You need to know today that that's not who Liberty Church is. That you need to be a part of something with some people who've been through some stuff. We're, gonna hear, we're here to say, hey, we love you where you are, but we love you too much to let you stay that way. Because that's what God says about you too. I love you just where you are. But I love you way too much to leave you there. That is what he wants us to do. Um, pastor Chris Hodges, uh, my pastor from Church of the Highlands, our time that we were there, has said numerous times that God is the one who sets you free. But you need people to help keep you free. You need accountability in your life. You need somebody whose shoulder you can cry on and lean on and say, hey, I can't do it on my own. And there's got to be somebody in your corner is sitting in this room right now who will say, you can't do it on your own? Cool, we'll do this together. We're for each other. Um, if you want to write that down, I want you to write it down like this. Community helps you stay free. Walk out of there. Walk out of here today with this. And so if you've, we've spent so much of the summer, uh, right, looking at the different ways that God tells us to treat each other as believers. We've talked about, um, we talked about loving one another, honoring one another, encouraging one another. I know last, or next week, Pastor Cliff is going to be closing out this series. His message is going to be on praying for one another I think there's going to be some opportunities for people in this room to really put that step into action. Lay hands on some people in the seats around you and lead each other well, serve each other well together. Right? That's what we're called to do. Uh, this series has been very intentionally challenging over the summer. Because for a lot of churches, the summer is when, you're, when your core is in the house, right? People are traveling, people are on vacation, but your, your people who are here are the people who are here. So this, this series has been intentionally challenging for who we're going to be as Liberty Church as we head into the fall. And I love that because I'm a challenger. If you've heard me preach before, I, I lay that out there every time I speak. I'm a challenger. The kids who come on Wednesday nights know that I'm a challenger. They don't get to stay where they're at if they come out and are a part of what we're doing. Um, my personal calling, which I steward right now through leading our kids and our youth, um, and it's an honor to do that, but I feel like my personal calling is to see people developed and become the thing that God created them and called them to be. And right now that's through pastoring our kids and our students, but just, I'm a challenger. If you come to me with something, I'm going to help you through it. But I'm going to go, hey, you better not do that again. <laughs> if you do, I'm still here, but you're going to be better off if you don't. That's just where I'm at. I feel like I believe God called me to shoot straight. I'm a challenger. Um, so the challenge that I'm putting out there for our church today is to go deep in community. Go deep in this faith family, this body of believers, this expression of God's house, Liberty Church, fully. As Christians, we're called to prioritize our relationships differently then other people are called to prioritize their relationships. We are supposed to be in the inner workings of each other's lives. If you say you follow Jesus, we're supposed to be open with each other. Uh, building each other up, we grow together. The Bible talks about iron sharpening iron. 
And if we're just all fake in here, smile and fake it till we make it, that's not iron, that's weak. Real strength is vulnerability. Because until you break out of that box that says, well, I'm not where God wants me to be, you're not going to get where God wants you to be until you're unashamed to walk out your stuff. <laughs> that's, just, that's just it. And we're going to be a place that will see you in the middle of your mess. So we're going to get you to the other side of it. That is what we do. Um, there are so many things that we have to do, though, to lead us to that level of devotion to each other, right? Um, we live in a time where we're more connected than ever through our smartphones, through our social media, through uh, all of our text messages and our red receipts where your friends can see if you read their text message and chose to text them back or not. Uh, we're more connected than ever. Um, I'm very thankful for those things because, you know, we live six hours away from my family. And so my parents who are in the room here somewhere, I don't know where they're sitting, but uh, my parents get to, Bexley gets to have a relationship with them through FaceTime more than she ever would if those things didn't exist. And so I'm thankful for that. I'm not, I'm not putting those things down. Um, but what I am saying is that the irony of that is that even though we are more connected socially than ever, we are absolutely more isolated than ever because of that same thing. And it's, it's dangerous because we have this, like, we have this pseudo connection with thousands of people online because we have our followers and we have our friends list and we have all these people who like and comment and share our stuff. But if it comes down to it, if you're, the stuff you're sharing on your social media feed was your real life instead of your highlight reel, how many people are liking and commenting and sharing that? Very, very few. <laughs> Come on. It's a dangerous place for us to be. Um, like I said, it provides us with this very non-reality, this illusion of connection uh, without any safeguards or accountability of true community. That's a, that's, that's a lot. Uh, Proverbs 19.24 actually says, A man with many companions may come to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Okay? Uh, this verse makes it super clear that it does not matter the amount of people that you're connected to. It don't matter how many people follow you on TikTok. If you don't have a single person in your life who's going to see you to the other side of whatever you're walking through. What matters is the quality of the connections that you have. Not the quantity of them. Um, I'm thankful for the people in my life who have shot very straight with me, who have helped me grow and helped me get to where God has called me to be. Um, and that's, that's a result of a few people. I know a whole lot of people, but there's a few people who've said, Colton, I see something in you. I see what you're supposed to be. And I'm going to help you get there, not just passively like and keep scrolling when you do something cool. There, so getting to know people within our church and making connections and having people in your life who are going to pour directly into you. Submitting to accountability and true community with safeguards and guardrails to say, hey, I see you headed, headed back into a path in your life where you used to be. And I'm not going to let you get that way. Ephesians 4, 1 through 2, Paul writes, As a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received, being completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Okay, so if you haven't figured it out yet, bear with one another is my one another statement that I'm talking about today. It's a challenging topic. Good thing I like to challenge people. 
because uh, bearing with one another is tough um, because people have problems, right? People got stuff. No one and nothing is perfect 100% of the time. It's just not going to happen. Uh, people aren't always easy to love. Some people drive us crazy. <laughs> people do things that make us go, ah, I don't know about that one. I, I'm not so sure. Uh, can we have a moment of honesty uh, here in church today? How many, pe- how many of you in the room have ever thought like, man, I'd be a whole lot more patient with people if they didn't do so much dumb stuff? <laughs> can we be honest today? I, I will be. I don't care. Um, I know I have been there. Uh, I'm going to ask Tim Sherrill if he'll come and help me with my, with my illustration real quick. I've got, I've got this thing that I want us to kind of look at. Um, sometimes we see things, we have trouble bearing with one another because we see things in other people, but we refuse to acknowledge the things in ourselves, right? And how, kind of how I want to illustrate that today is I have this little magnifying glass that I got from our nursery this morning, cause, and it's tiny and it works because you got to get it real close, and it helps the illustration work out real well. Um, but as Christians, right, it's really, really easy because we know truth, and we're set apart, and it's easy if we allow it to walk around with our little magnifying glass and go, I see that over there. Oh, I see that in you. Hey, I, I, I see that. Hey, let's, let's, let's work. Hey, can we work on that? Because, like, I see you. Okay, I see that in you. I see that in you. I see that in you. But a mirror does something totally different, right? That magnifying glass is small. I had to get it real close to be able to look and see. But something that a mirror does is it reflects, right? And they're designed, actually, where you can see some things up close without ever having to actually get right in the middle. It's designed to reflect. And how many of us struggle with there's a mirror right here, but we'd much rather live right here rather than turn around and go, man, there's that thing in their life. I got to bear with them through that. Hey, there's that other thing in their life. I got to bear with them through that. But if we turn around and we look at ourselves in this mirror, We can see, man, I'm bearing with them through that, but I also have this thing in me, and somebody's helping bear with me as I help bear with them. And as they bear with me, I can bear with this person, and we all get through our things together, right? We don't want to, man. It's tough. So we don't want to see the things in ourselves. It's a lot easier to just judge. And I feel like for too long, the church has gatekept the greatest news in the world. Because Christians would rather have a magnifying glass than a mirror. And I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that says we're going to look in the mirror. We're going to grow. We're going to get better, not just in number, but in spiritual maturity. We're going to get better. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own. We can be difficult too. Right? I can be difficult. <laughs> but if I've got a two by four hanging out of my face, <laughs> what business do I have? Going, hey, I see that little speck over there. Let's, let's work on that. It's not it. So us being called to bear with one another, like that verse says, 
is we're supposed to be in each other's mess in love. (laughs) Come on. Which means that we know how to walk the line of what do we tolerate in the lives of our brothers and sisters who are baby believers who are just growing in Christ and learning and making mistakes. We toe that line of what do we guide towards But what do we stand firm in and say, hey, that's not what we do. We tow that line. That is bearing with one another. But the culture we live in today demands two extremes from us, right? We either have to condone everything. And if we don't condone everything, then we must be condemning everything, And that's not what God has asked us to do as a church. We aren't supposed to condone everything. We lead and we guide and we pastor. But we're also never called to condemn. Because Christ didn't condemn. So what authority do we have? Um, Pastor Rick Warren uh, has this incredible quote. And he says, our culture has accepted Two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means that you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. (laughs) You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. There is another way to live our lives outside of the extreme of condemnation and just condoning everything. Um, We don't get to condone everything. We're called to sharp iron sharpens iron. We're called to build each other up. We also have no authority to condemn anything. Because who are we? But the literal definition of bear in the context that we're talking about it today is to prop up, to elevate. In Acts 3, we get to read this incredible story of a man who was paralyzed from birth. And every single day, someone carried him to the gate of a temple so that he could beg for money for the people who were there. One day, the disciples, Peter and John, were at the gate of this temple... And this paralyzed man, he asks them for money. And in verse 6, Peter tells him, silver and gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by his right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. And he jumped to his feet and began To walk. The man who was paralyzed from birth that day received his miracle because someone made a decision every day of their life to be inconvenienced to get him what he needed. And the Bible doesn't say whether that was one single person or whether it was a community of people. We don't don't get to know that. But the likelihood that 365 days a year, a single person got up every day and carried this man to the temple, I feel like is probably slim. This man had a community of people who surrounded him to do something that he could not yet do for himself. And that day, he received his miracle. Not because of anything he could do but because of the actions of the people around him. He left with more than just money for someone to run to the store and buy his groceries. He left with the ability to fend for himself, to take care of himself, to walk, to do things that he had never done before. There's another very similar story. Um, Now, we're not going to read all of it on the screen, but it's absolutely one of my favorites to talk about. We've talked about it with the students on Wednesday night more than once. It's the story of another man who was paralyzed 
from birth. And the Bible says that he had friends who would put him on a mat. And when they found out that Jesus was in town, they were like, we've got to get him to Jesus so that he can be healed. And when they get him on the mat and they get him to the house, they realize that the house is packed out, that there's no way they can get in the door. They can't get to Jesus. And so these friends, think about it for a second. If you know the story, they, they climb up on the roof. And they, when I'm like in Sunday school as a kid, they're like, they, they just got him to Jesus. But like, if you really think about it, these people climbed on a roof of a house lifted this paralyzed man by his dead weight onto the roof, tore the roof off the building, and lowered him down. And Jesus said, because of your friend's faith, you are healed. Liberty Church, are we going to be a tear off the roof? Church, come on. Are we going to break down the doors of people that we haven't seen in a while because we don't know what's going on in their life? Are we going to call people till the phone rings, until they pick up? Are we going to tear off the roof to see Foley, Alabama have a radical encounter with Jesus Christ? Is that who we're going to be? It has to be. That's what we're called to do. And I just have this I have to take a second and I have to honor my youth group, my youth team. I want you to know that those kids, those kids are a tear off the roof youth group. I have watched those kids weep at the altar with each other. I have watched those kids lay hands on each other. I have seen one of our students question whether she was worthy of even continuing on with her life and another girl lay her hand on her forehead and prophesy a future and a hope over her life. Those are some tear off the roof Christian teenagers. So if you've got teenagers in the room who don't come out on Wednesday night, you need to get them there because that's a community you want them to be a part of. It don't have anything to do with me or any of the team that shows up. That's just their nature. They are stewarding the thing that God has gifted them to steward right now. I tell them all the time, that's not my, that's not my ministry, it's yours. I just get the honor of help facilitate it. And you guys need to feel the same way about this space. This isn't just the worship team's ministry. This isn't just Pastor Cliff's message moment. This church, this is your ministry. If, it, if you guys all go away, so do we. You know what I mean? This is yours. People are impacted by the, the gospel of Jesus because of you. Because you care enough to meet in their homes, to take them out to lunch, to invite them to church, to say, hey, join my small group. To say, hey, I'd love for you to serve on Team Liberty with me. I'd love for you to help hold that baby. I'd love for you to help hold this door open with me. I'd love for you to help shake hands. You're a musician. We'd love to see you worship on that platform. This is your ministry. You are called to bear with one another. To tear off the roof for each other. That's my emotional little shameless plug today. Man, I love my kids. <laughs> and I love you guys. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, and you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ sounds a lot like what we talked about earlier we don't want to be a church that's real good at holding the magnifying glass but won't turn around and look in the mirror if we're going to bear with one another if we're going to be in the middle of people's mess sometimes we get in the middle of stuff right we got to constantly be willing to turn around 
and look in that mirror and say, I helped them through that. Let's make sure I'm not in the middle of that. Let me look in this mirror. All right, I'm ready to go. That's what we're called to do. Jesus criticized the religious elite for being a burden on the people who attended the temple. He said, who do you think you are as ministers to burden others instead of lifting them up? Ministers aren't just the people who stand on this platform. Not anymore. Jesus gave us, the church, the Holy Spirit. We are all ministers, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to consider who we are. We have to consider how we have fallen short and how Christ has propped us up, allowed us to lean on him and bear our burdens on that cross. We actually start walking, when we can do that, we start walking in the greatest, one of the greatest callings that God has ever put on our life, and that is humility. To be a humble people who can receive those who are in pain, who are in the middle of it, who are in the thick of something that some of us could never even imagine. And say, man, that still don't make me any better than you. Jesus started working on me and started working on my calling into full-time ministry when I was in an absolutely terrible place in my life. I wasn't even 100% sure that my life was, was worth it. When I get a text message from this person that I had talked to a few times, who is now my wife, Beth, who's like, hey, we need some people to help run slides for the message. You want to help? Sure. Why not? I can, click, I can click the space bar. You know what I mean? Like, I wasn't even sure <laughs> who God was. Somebody just said, hey, would you serve on this team with me? And he started working right in the middle of where I was and presented me with opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to preach the gospel and to see people come to know Jesus. And I'm not saying if I wasn't here that those people still wouldn't know Jesus like, God has a perfect plan, and I'm just honored that he chose to let me be a part of it. But what that means for us as Liberty Church is we are going to surrender our desired pace and our desired preferences to see people feel welcomed here. We will never learn to bear with one another until we learn to live in a little bit of inconvenience, right? Um, a great example of setting aside our preferences is if you didn't notice, we've got some pop and drape in the back of the room right now, um, giving up some preferences. Some of your guys' favorite seat disappeared today. It, it went away a little bit, um, and it's here to stay. It's, it's, those pop and drapes here to stay for a little while, because in this season, we're called to bear with one another, and that means for a season, we're going to pull this church in close. We're going to sit together. We're going to love each other. We're going to shake hands. There's not going to be a first-time guest who can walk through this door, sit on a row by themselves, no one speak to them, and then they get to leave. This is a family. The people need to experience that love. You don't get to sit on a row by yourself anymore. If that's your preference, I feel like God's asking you to surrender that today so that he can work in the lives of the people who aren't here yet. And you know how we'll know when it's worth it? 
when we see people say, I'm making a decision for Jesus today. I was just going to sneak in the door and walk right back out. But someone shook my hand. Someone sat next to me. I thought I was going to get up and leave, but instead I stayed and I had an encounter with Jesus that changed my eternity. It's worth it for that. Our preferences mean nothing. It pales into comparison to seeing people's lives change because of Jesus in our community. Like I said earlier, part of bearing with one another is living in each other's mess. That's a marathon. It's not a sprint. We don't just get to shake their hand and say, how you doing today? And their whole life is radically transformed. No more pain, no more problems. Everything's just all well and good. It's all together. We don't get that. Proverbs 12, 18 says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So Liberty Church, my last challenge for you today is let's walk in wisdom with how we bear with one another. Let's speak truth, but let's speak truth in love. There's healing brought by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is brought by your words. Sometimes the Holy Spirit's bought, brought by your presence. And he's here today in this room. And so my challenge, my, my calling, my ask for you today, for those of you who know Jesus, is I want you to think about some people in your life that you know who have been like, man, They're a little difficult to love. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to lead you, guide you, direct your path and your life into how to steward the gospel of Jesus to them better. How can I die to myself to see that person have the encounter that they need? That's what Jesus asks of us. But if you're in this room today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, what you need to know is that he wants to do everything that I've just talked about today for you and so much more. That he is the son of God, lived, died, rose again, to defeat death so that you don't have to stay where you are. So that you can not only spend eternity with Him, but be set free here on this earth from the pain and the bondage and the things that have you caught up. And if today you need to make that decision with everyone's head bowed, everyone's eyes closed, Today, you're saying, hey, Pastor Colson, this message is for me. I need to know, I needed to know today that Jesus was going to bear my burdens, that he loves me, that he cares for me, that he's going to walk with me, that he died for me. And you want to make a decision today to make him the Lord of your life, to be your Savior. I just want you to raise your hand right now. Come on. That's good. I see you. Thank you, Jesus. So God, right now, I thank you so much for today, for every single one of these people who were here, for those in this room who made a decision to know you as their Lord and as their Savior today. God, I pray that you would bless this church, bless this congregation. That, Lord, that you would anoint them, give them humility, give them peace 
give them clarity in what it looks like to bear with one another. Let this place be a place for prodigals, truly, where people walk through this door and know that they're home. And let the people in this room today always, Lord, create an atmosphere where your Holy Spirit can move. It's in your name that we ask all of this. Amen. Amen.